to the first Neo Rio 2020 Home Artist and Community Roundtable. We are forging new territory here because up for the last 11 years, this event has been in person at Wild Rivers out by the Rio Grande. And so it's a bit strange to be sitting here in front of a computer, but I'm really glad that it's happening. And I really appreciate those of you who are joining us as artists for being here and those of you who are coming as, as participants. So thank you so much. Um, I want to thank people specifically who are helping to make this possible. Um, I don't think she was able to come tonight, but Sarah Javazinski was helped to make, helped to coordinate this event. Martha Shep, who's also one of our artists, Emily Wild has helped a lot with graphic design. Um, volunteer Jean Viev de Velis, some of you may have um, actually gotten your box from her. And then my family, who's also on, hi family. Um, and many other friends and volunteers and colleagues, and also Tally and Nick, who are helping to make this sort of hopefully smooth. Yeah, so far so good. Um, I also need to do due diligence here and thank those of us who have helped um, with Neo Rio financially this year. We have um, some individual donors, especially I'd like to thank Mike Powers, who is in Texas. Um, local businesses and media sponsorships as well. And this project is supported in part by New Mexico Arts, a division of the culture of cultural affairs, Department of Cultural Affairs, and by the National Endowment for the Arts, Taos Community Foundation, and Drawing on Earth, with additional sponsorships from Cuesta Economic Development Fund, Cuesta del Rio News, Cuesta Visitor Center, Taos Public Library, Zia Event Design, North Star Toys, Cuesta Lumber and Hardware, and many other individuals and volunteers. So I also would like to um, begin by honoring the ground where each of us is sitting. We're not all together in one place, but we're all sitting in different places. And so I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge wherever that may be, whether it's a um, very rural place or in a city, um, to acknowledge the ecology of that area, the soil, the rocks, the animals, the plants, the people, and all the people made stuff and parts that make up the larger home that we all share. Um, there are legacies of displacement and mi migration that brings us all to the places where we are. And so I'd like to recognize the generations of human ancestors of various creeds that have all gone before us. And um, I'm joining you from the ancestral homelands of the Hickory Apache, Pueblos, Comanche, and Ute. And I invite you to look up your location on a cool website that is native-land.ca. Um, Tally, would you mind popping that into the chat? So it's kind of a, it's a neat resource to see. You can look up definitely all around in the world, but, or like US, but in the world too. So as we begin the round table, I ask that we all consider the seeds that we carry in us of place, of family, heritage, experience, and home. So um, also our artists will be introducing themselves as they begin their presentations with these simple prompts. Um, the place where they come from, the place or the places that they call home now, where, they're, where you're calling in from, and this is a little silly, but it gives us a little insight into who you are and not a whole big bio, is um, if, what animal would you be and why? And so um, it, please go ahead and um, join in that if you want by putting in the chat where you come from, what you, the place you call home now, and then bonus, bonus points if you wanna put in what animal you'd be and why. So, um, Nick is our timekeeper. He's gonna hold up a sign at five minutes for each artist. He'll be keeping track, five minute mark, and um, ring a little bell or something so that we know that we're coming close to the end and then within one minute wrap up so that we can kind of keep it, keep it rolling, respect everybody's time. Um, so I think that's about it. The only thing I wanted to say is that, um, Basically all of our artists um, in some way or another heard about the project um, and then either were um, emailed or happened upon it some way and were given a box that looked like this. This is the starting point. It was a, it's a 
mostly pine box that has a sliding lid on top. And um, so all the creations that, that you're going to see tonight started this way. Just wanted to, and what we're going to be focusing on and um, reflecting on and celebrating in a way is the concept of home. So we'll start with our first artist, Carol Schrader. Okay, here we go. So, hi, uh, my name's Carol Schrader. I am uh, an art teacher here in Santa Fe. I teach middle school art in the public schools. And um, I come from Los Angeles, California. I grew up near the water. And um, this, pro this uh, project just really um, struck me because it ties in with so much of the work of my previous um, artwork that I've done. Um, often has themes of houses and boats. And so I'm going to try and share some little videos that I made of, uh, let's see, will this play? Of, so to give you a, a tour of my um, house here. So this I called um, House of Mirrors, Leaving the Labyrinth. Because since I was um, a little kid, I have had dreams about houses. Um, and the houses on the inside are often labyrinths and the houses are often sinking underwater and i um, grew up right on the coast in la and uh, i knew that the land that i lived on there um, had once been underwater and had risen up out of the water in um, different um, uh, archaeological events of, of earthquakes that California is prone to. Um, so there you can see the, um, the labyrinth inside of the house. Um, and it's reflected by a number of broken mirrors that are on the inside and also on the outside. Um, I felt like the in my dreams, the houses were always sinking back into the ocean, just like the land had risen out of the ocean. But as I, um, you know, in my adulthood, that image has a really different meaning for me as we think about climate change and the coastal lands actually um, are sinking back underwater. Um, so I um, created this house um, and it's full of mirrors that are the windows to show that um, things are distort distorted. Um, instead of letting in light, these windows um, reflect distortion and um, a sense of unreality. Um, so they're not, they're not very helpful as windows anymore. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the other thing that is often in my, um, my art is the theme of Ariadne's thread. And Ariadne was in the labyrinth with the Minotaur, if you remember um, Greek history or Greek uh, mythology. And she le left a thread or a yarn so that she could find her way back out um, of the labyrinth. And so for me, the symbol of the red thread or the red wire is sort of finding the pathway out. And in the house, um, this thread, this wire was coiled up in the labyrinth and then it kind of found its way out the door. And the door actually literally became the ocean and the boat um, to sail away in. So when I cut out the door, then that turned into the ocean. And then I um, cut the boat out of the um, ocean. So underneath the boat is the hole where I cut it out from. Uh, so it all, all of those pieces are actually once part of the house. Um, so I really enjoyed um, working with this. Uh, the willows are from, I live right here on the Santa Fe River and I cut the willows to make the roof um, and the, uh, the rigging for the sailboat and the frames for the windows. Um, and maybe I'll read my little story. Do I have time, I think? Um, so, Here's the story that I wrote that I had on my audio. Once upon a time, there was a little girl who lived on an island. She lived alone in a little house on the hill. The island was sinking and every day, the girl would mark a new place on the shore where the water would come to. 
The house seemed small from the outside, but it was surprisingly large inside and was filled with confusing and maze-like passageways and walls. The girl would walk through the maze every day, unwinding a spool of yarn as she went so she could find her way back out. At first, the maze frightened her. What if she lost her way? But eventually, she came to find it meditative to walk through the labyrinthine twists and turns. One day, the little girl decided the water had gotten too high. It was almost lapping at the bottom step of the house. So she decided to make a boat. She took the door from the house for its base and made a mast from a nearby sapling. She fashioned sails out of some curtains from the window. On the boat, she felt happy and calm. She caught fish for her supper and dolphins came to keep her company and cheer her along. She set sail for the land she could see on the horizon where she would build a new home safe from the rising waters. Also, I have to do this. What animal would you be? Oh, <laughs> maybe a pill bug tonight. We'll see. <laughs> um, uh, one thing that was a nice surprise with the piece was when I lit it for taking photos, I realized that all the shattered mirrors cast these beautiful reflections. Um, so I love creating art and then like the art that we create surprises us. So. Thank you so, thank so you. much, Carol. Yep. And, um, yep. So save your questions for Carol or put them in the chat. And let's move on to um, Crystal and Ariessa Medina. Hi there, I'm Crystal. I'm Ariessa. And I'm, I don't have a video or anything. I'm not sure exactly what we're supposed to do, but we can show you what we have. Yeah, that's exactly, Carol was an unusual case. because. <laughs> Yeah, no, that was that I should have warned people that Carol was we actually pre talked about um, about her showing a video um, to make sure that she could share a screen and blah, blah, blah. But mostly what I thought people would be doing is showing their cube and, you know, talking into the camera. So you're right on. on All right. Camera. Awesome. Because OK, but, that's my yeah, you Tell us where you're from, where you're what you was your original home, where you're now and what animals you guys would be. Okay, So um. I've grown up in Taos and I'm now up in Arroyo Seco, which is pretty much Taos. Um, I guess what animal I would choose to be would be um, an elephant. I like elephants. They're big and they're powerful, but they're super smart and they're super kind. So I, I really like those and they're spiritual. Um, so with me, I've always been here in Taos through my birth and I'd probably be a wolf no specific reason but i think they're cool <laughs> so this is our cube i don't know if you guys can see this oh sorry i've been a bit busy so excuse us so that's our cube and inside of our cube we have let me pull this out for you okay so inside of our cube we have a heart so if you guys can see that it's made out of, um, what is it, sculpting, putty, and um, floral, floral foam. So we made it an anatomical heart instead of the other heart because we wanted to just kind of describe that home is where the heart is. And this was kind of about the pandemic being at home. So we keep it inside the box, but it can come out of the box because your heart goes with you everywhere. So that's why we chose to do it that way. Um, if you flip this around, we have what is the gorge bridge up here with the kind of the water coming down and then we have the El Salto waterfalls here. So this is where we live. It's probably about half a mile, not, not even, even less than that. Yeah, so that's right where we are. So, you know, on our days, this is where we go and this is where we spend a lot of time, especially since we can't go anywhere. So this right here, this is just, do you want to kind of talk about that a little bit? It's really just our night sky. It has a lot of colors that shine through within the wispy hot moon. No, I didn't really. I feel like it's pretty spiritual. We also have the Zia symbol there, and then we have um, we have a butterfly on it, just to say that we're free and we're able to do whatever we need to, and we're still able to get through this. Um, on the bottom of it, I think this is the right way. We have the COVID because this is the whole reason we are where we are right now. But on top of that, and right here on the little door, we have um, joy to the world and love and 
just peace to everybody. So I believe that we can all get through this. And this is kind of just an example of how our life has been lived for quite some time now. So that's our box. Well, that's awesome. Thank Since you. we have a tiny bit more time in the, yeah. in your six minutes, um, I remember in what you're in your bio that you mentioned that you have medical, a medical side to things. And so that, that, that was part of the reason that you chose to do an anatomical heart rather than a, you know, symbolic heart. It's, um, Ariessa, it's you who's, who's working in a medical field. Yeah, I am. She's, she's working, um, in the medical field right now and she's, um, probably about two clinicals away from getting into nursing school. So um, it's taken a little bit longer for her because, well, because it's clinicals and you can't do them right now. So she's on the second semester of trying to complete what she planned on completing last semester, but everything's on hold. So it's kind of chaotic with that right now, but we're getting there. That's cool. What was it? I really like that you created this box together, you know, um, it, and I, believe your mother and daughter. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, sometimes working together is, as family members can be uh, intense. So I was just interested what it was like to make it if it was together, if it was, you know, challenging or, or sort of like a bonding experience or anything else. I don't know. Those two things came to mind. <laughs> For me, um, it was both. It was both. Um, I own a salon. She's in the medical field. Um, we're both pretty independent and louder than she is, but she's definitely more crafty than I am. So the heart was really all of her idea and I put in all the rest of it, but, um, well with you of course, but it was definitely, we kind of separated some pieces and stuff because it was just easier to do because I'd be like, let's go this way. And she'd be like, no, let's go this way. But it worked out, it worked together. What do you think? Yeah, it's a, two different sites, the yeah. same story. <laughs> so it was pretty good though. I think we did pretty well and it was fun to make. It took us some time. It took us a little bit more time than we expected, but it's been fun. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's Thank that's you. <laughs> we'll come back to you if others have, others have questions. So next is um, Davey Vargo. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and right now I call home, I live in Lama Canyon, in the Lama neighborhood of Cuesta. And if I were an animal, I would pick to be a spider. And maybe because they have eight legs, and they can get around. As a kid, I used to love going in our basement and looking at the spiders up on the walls and things like that. So I have this affinity with a spider. So now I can go to my box. Let's see. While you're doing that, Davey, I keep forgetting to say my uh, animal, which is hi hypocritical of me. I'm sorry. I would like to be oh. a migrating, um, some sort of migrating bird because I really am missing travel and want to be able to see many, many places. Uh, both because of the pandemic, but also just because I'm very oriented to raising two little daughters and we're not traveling as much. So the pandemic is keeping us more homebound. So there we go, Davey. That looks good. So that's my... Okay. That's my... my um, <laughs> okay. My outside of the box symbolize, um, symbolizes things to me that mean family. You know, this is pretty much like the front of my place, what it looks like. And things of family or, or home would also be the woods here. And then I have um, <clears throat> a little bit of corn, like vegetable garden and things like that is home. And then here, let's see, people, you know, friends, family, you know, out in the yard and just enjoying each other's company. And then on this side is some flowers and the Orno that I recently built. Um, underneath, 
if you look at it, it's roots. So the earth is as my home and the roots, um, like on this side, if you turn them over, they're the roots for the trees here. And the um, inside though is the peculiar thing. I was visiting Cleveland, Ohio and my family and I came home and there was a strange vehicle in the driveway and there wasn't supposed to be anybody here. And I um, got out and had to find out who it was and I did see someone and I, that I recognized. Her, v is what I'll call her V. And then there was um, K. Anyway, I go up to K and he's wearing one of my necklaces. And I asked him, what are you doing with my necklace on? And he said, well, I just wanted to wear it. And if you, if you want it, I'll give it back. And then I told him, I said, well, you could have it. And I said, what were you doing in my house? And he said, well, if I made a mess, I'll clean it up. And so I was, that really, um, how can I say it? I was very nervous at the time. And I come up to the house. All of what I'm telling you now or most is, is in my audio story. But I, I come up to the house and I look out, look into the house through the windows and it's trashed. The one room is trashed. I come to the other windows and it's trashed. There's things thrown around. Some of my artwork was thrown out in the yard. The doors were locked, couldn't get in. I met up with V and anyway, put her through the window that there was an open window and she opened the doors and I um, came in and turned the lights on. There were no lights on. The power went out. The fridge was open. There was food on the floor. The place, the place was, it was just a mess. It, it stank, which I couldn't tell immediately what the smell was, you know, and I put some of the semi-frozen things back in the freezer, plug this thing in, go into the bedroom. It looks like they slept in my bed with their muddy cowboy boots on. And so I ended up not being able to stay there that night and not knowing what to do. And, and they wanted me to go get them some cigarettes in town and their car had a dead battery so they couldn't leave. So I just, I ended, I ended up going to a friend's house and spent the next five days there. Um, the next day, a group of us got here and got them out. It wasn't only my house that got trashed, but the landlords. And, oh, uh, what else to say? Anyway, so that takes me to the inside of the house, which a day or after this, I open up my stove, my wood burning stove, and like all this, metal and stuff just comes like falling into the floor of the house and you know there's molten metal and things that were burned and so anyway without all the junk in the house that's sort of the inside of my the house it's just you know a regular house with a kitchen and a stove and a wood-burning fireplace and um, when I first read about this, the box thing, I, um, I was concerned about telling this story because it's the antithesis of home, of what I found when I came here. And, um, oh, what was I going to say? Um, oh, there was a part in the ad that says you could sound like you could trash your house, but all you had to do is document what you were doing. And so I thought, oh, well, that would be good. So I could tell this story because it's not like a pleasant story and it, it's very difficult for me to go through this thing. So I want to um, just thank you all for listening and and thanks for um, yeah, that's it. Thanks, Davey. That is a 
difficult thing to go through. It's, yeah, really crazy. And Davies has even more details in his audio. If you want to hear more of the nitty gritty of having your, your house um, kind of, you know, really invaded. So I'm sorry that happened to you. Now we are going on to, um, next is Mal Malia Reeves on behalf of the Field Institute of Taos Nature Art Group. I actually have two boxes tonight, so yeah. you'll hear from me again, but that's because I only made one of them. The other one I'm presenting um, on behalf of a group of kids who I wish could be here to present for you, but um, it's hard to get people together these days. Um, so I work with the Field Institute of Taos. Uh, if you haven't heard of us, we're a community nonprofit that's been running for almost 25 years, which is pretty amazing for a nonprofit in a small town. Um, you, you might know Susie Fiore, who is our director. She uh, is sort of the lifeblood of the organization. And um, she hired me a few years ago. And, uh, oh, I forgot to tell you, I'm from Taos. I grew up here. Um, I was born and raised in Canyon, just uh, east of the plaza. And um, I, still live here in Taos, obviously, but now I live up in Arroyo Seco. I just recently moved up here, so it's kind of like being in a different town. Um, and if I were to be an animal, I think I would probably be a falcon of some sort uh, to soar in the mountains. Um, so I grew up here in Taos and I came, I left for eight years. I lived um, abroad and on the East Coast and up in Colorado. And I, I ended up back here um, maybe seven years ago or so. And um, so home, home for me is very much tied to this place because I grew up here and also because I live here now. And I tried to make home in a lot of other places as well and it didn't work out. Um, so for me to be able to work with kids here in Taos is really special because that's where I grew up. I was one of those kids and that's what the Field Institute does. So it's, it's pretty much one of the coolest jobs that you could think of. I get to go outside and play with kids in the mountains or in the desert every single day. Uh, we, we do it four days a week and we work with kids ages um, five through 18. Um, and this summer when coronavirus started, I had no idea what it was going to look like. I wasn't sure if we'd be able to operate and it um, tore my heart up to think that we wouldn't because kids need this more than ever. They need to be with other kids. They need to get outside. They need to be creative. Um, and we were, we did manage to run programs all summer. We just had five kids per group and they wore masks and keeping six year olds six feet apart is really hard, but <laughs> they could do it um, surprisingly well if you coach them through it. And, um, and then this fall when school started up and we realized that kids are going to be staring at a screen all day, stuck at home, it became really important to us to operate, to offer fall uh, sessions for kids, which we had never done before. Um, but we, uh, we ran them this, this fall. And so that's where this box came from, was one of those fall sessions. So I had five kids in my group um, and they were all uh, nine and 10 years old and um, come from a really kind of variety of backgrounds. Um, but all here in Taos, all local kids growing up here. Um, it was a, uh, my session was a nature art session. So we met once a week, um, just for four sessions. And we did something different every week. Uh, we made, um, we made little rainbow catchers to hang in the windows because all those birds were hitting windows not so long ago. Uh, we, we made rain dance sticks that they could do rain dances with. So kind of really focusing on nature based art using natural materials. So when we found out about this exhibition with the, uh, the Neo Rio exhibition, it, uh, it, it was a really cool opportunity for us to bring that into this group of kids that we already had meeting. So um, the kids, I showed them the box and I told them that the theme was home and I kind of coached them through some discussion about what home meant to them. And coming from our shared perspective, a group of six of us, well, and, and five of them particularly, and everyone had a different perspective. A lot of people talked about their house or um, 
you know, certain places that are special to them. But when we talked about it from a field institute pr perspective of getting outside and showing kids um, how the outdoors is our home uh, as much as our home itself, uh, they really quickly came to a consensus that they wanted to make this for their box, which um, I know I don't have great light here, but you can see um, that they painted mountains on the outside of the box. And this was one of the boys painted all these mountains, which are really impressively done. He's nine years old, I think. And um, so they wanted to do mountains on the outside, uh, which is pretty obviously influenced by the mountains that we uh, have surrounding us every day. And that these kids um, mountain bike and ski and hike, um, and play in the river with all the time. And then um, the inside, in a, which you, I don't know if you can see on here, but I encourage you to look up um, the photos that are on the website. Because on the inside, they decided to do a little camping scene. So the orange here is a tent. And there's a little campfire, which you'll have to see in a photo because it's hard to see on here. But they made all of this out of Sculpey. They decided to add animals in totally on their own because um, they had decided that uh, when they go out into the forest and make their home the forest for the night or for, for the several nights when they go camping, they share that home with the animals. Um, which I thought was really insightful of them. So in there, there's a snake and a bluebird, a little mouse living in a little cave, and uh, another animal at the back that was originally supposed to be a turtle, but uh, we decided to turn it into a marmot because it's more uh, applicable to the mountain scene, and, and a bunch of uh, trees. So, and it's hard to see, but it's a night scene. So there's stars painted uh, above and the mountains are dark. So it's kind of a, it's a, to me, what they came up with, and they did 100% of this on their own. What they came up with ended up being this really cozy scene. And I think a lot of people in this world would consider sleeping out in the wilderness with animals a an extremely uncomfortable uh, place to be but for these kids who have who have been with us for the last five years and we've taken them camping and we've taught them uh, what the mountains feels like uh, when it can comfort you when it teaches you that uh, I think that they um, it, I was really proud of them to be able to create a cozy comfortable scene that that really felt like home to them Thank you. <clears throat> Would you like to do yours now or do you want to have a break and come back? Which sure, I'll, I can do it right now. Yeah, I have it right here. So, um, and it's, it's similarly themed. So, um, I, so I'm, I'm an artist. I studied art uh, at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire and um, grew up in Taos, but never thought that I would do much with my art. Um, and couldn't decided not to be a professional artist very consciously uh, because I don't like making art uh, just to make a living, which is a whole nother discussion. <laughs> but, uh, but I do make a lot of artwork still as a hobby and um, not just a hobby, but like a very important part of my life. And so um, this piece, again, really similar to what the kids came up with and, and on separate, separate days, separate times, uh, when I thought about home, I thought a lot about um, the mountains surrounding Taos. And when I left Taos, uh, I went and lived in the UK. I lived in Wales, and there's no mountains there. Not really. Um, and I missed the mountains so desperately. I missed our forests, and uh, I missed our weather. And it... To me, that was what I thought about when I thought about home. Like I, I lived in a beautiful house that was, um, you know, 100, uh, 200 year old adobe hacienda. I, I had an amazing place to grow up. But when I left, what I really thought about the most was the mountains. That's what I missed. And so to me, that's, that's a really important part of this place that I call home. Um, my artwork is usually is very much themed around mountains in general, at least at the moment it's gone through different um, phases throughout my artistic career. Um, currently I use primarily watercolor paint. I hadn't really 
um, used watercolor and wood before. So that was a um, new experience and the, having the box as a prompt really encouraged me to like reach out. Um, but the watercolor looked, su looked super cool on the wood. Um, so I decided to paint a mountain scene on each of the four sides, but I wanted to leave the wood showing. Uh, you'll see that wood and trees is a theme throughout this piece. Um, on each of the four sides, I decided to paint a different season. So you can see this, se this season um, is fall. You can tell because there's quite a lot of colors and that's kind of where we're at right now. But each one is different. So that one's obviously winter. And then spring. And this one is summer. This one, lots of greens and warm colors. Um, on the bottom, I also just added a, uh, a little secret uh, tree that's sort of all by itself. And um, when I thought about the mountains, I thought particularly about evergreen trees. And I think right now there's so much change happening in the world. And I've spent all summer working with kids who are totally thrown off. I mean, this is a horrible time to be a 10 year old. <laughs> they can't hang out with their friends and they uh, can't go, you know, a lot of them at that age like school and they want to go to school but they can't and um it's they don't quite understand they understand everything happening but they also can't they they're not processing it well and some families and some parents and some support networks have done really good at supporting the kids and giving them the space and educating them and some kids are the opposite and have no idea what's going on and throughout the whole thing i've been really taking the, these kids out into nature and using the natural things around us to find insight to understand what's going on. So we talk a lot about emotional intelligence. We talk about understanding your emotions. And a lot of times it's easier to do that with something that's outside of yourself. And nature is a really wonderful thing to use in order to understand the turmoil inside. And so I chose to, I chose to focus on the evergreen trees. So every one of these seasons on the box has at least one evergreen tree. Um, probably a, f a fir because we have a lot of firs here and this is a fir <laughs> but it could be a spruce or something else too um the idea of an evergreen the idea that it's that it's always green that it's always alive um, throughout every season uh, the evergreen trees look the same each season so i really liked that idea that you could watch the seasons change, that, that change can happen all around you, but that there's some anchor, something that's holding you in place and making things feel okay. And that's kind of the, the symbol of an evergreen tree in this piece. Um, and, and the tree is actually, I don't know if you can see, it's actually planted in a pot inside. Uh, you can't quite see, but um, I'm not sure that a tree this large will live in a pot, but it is still alive and we plan on replanting it um, at our base camp location uh, so that it can continue to be evergreen. Well, thank you, Malia. There's a lot of really wonderful metaphors in that box, both of those boxes. Thank you. If you have um, questions, just stow them away. In the meantime, let us move on to Joy Purcell. I was raised in San Rafael and um, graduated from UC Berkeley and then married the best man of my twin sister. And we moved to Southern California. And I can't see my picture. Yeah, I know. And so, um, and, and then, um, raised four children in Palm Springs and the Cuyah Indians are really, uh, this is their area. And so we spent a lot of time with the kids out jeeping in the back countries, et cetera. And then uh, we moved to, uh, after we retired, we spent part of the time in Taos, New Mexico. And so it was John Viev that told me about the boxes. And so I thought, well, that would be a fun project. And uh, so I went down and picked up a box, the library, and um, decided to title my box, 
bubbles in a time of COVID. And we uh, are here in Palm Springs and my box is in Taos. <laughs> and so I went online and I have two wonderful daughters that helped me out. And so we pulled some pictures and so I'll, I'll show you the pictures and we'll talk about the, the uh, box. Okay, it's with um, paper that we made uh, in 2017 at the Taos uh, Center for the Arts. And we had a, a, a workshop there for a week and it was really fun. A gal came and, and we made sheets of paper four feet by six feet and it was incredible. Well, there was extra pulp left over. And so we thought, well, what can we do with that? So Janie Farmer said, uh-huh, let's see if we can take, and what we did is we got weed, re a retardant cloth, and then we laid the fabric out on a driveway. And then we threw these buckets of the excess pulp. And so we ended up with all of these bubbles on the uh, driveway. And so then we had a, uh, one of the gals took and she cut this, these strips. So we all ended up with strips of this paper. And so I thought, well, I can cover that box and this will be bubbles in the time of COVID. And we all create our bubbles and bring our bubbles together and then the bubbles change. And so I covered the box with the, uh, all the different uh, pieces. I peeled off, which was a, a real challenge, peeling the paper because it was different um, textures and, and thicknesses. And so then uh, I peeled it off and then I, I uh, put it on the box and then I, but, well then, we have inside the box, I lined it with aluminum foil, and then I took and made accordion books with dowels so that you could pull these out. And so we have all these different uh, situations that we get in and to trust the people with the COVID. And so, is it a fence? Is it a, a space? And so, and it was really fun to take and play with these um, accordion folds. And then, uh, so I took and I, I'm just showing you some of the, uh, the pictures of the, the way that it worked out. So it was really kind of a kinetic uh, way to move the paper around. And then if, if you look closely, there was, I've taken some incense and burned holes in the Kozo paper to give another dimension for the, the bubbles so that the light will shine through. And so this is another, and I'm sorry I don't have the box, but I didn't realize I'd be in California this long. So <laughs> this is my, uh, uh, challenge to solve the problem. Awesome. That's a great workaround. I think you gave us a good sense of it. I really do honestly wish that we could see all of these in person. I think that's been like for me as a curator or organizer, the biggest heartache is not to be able to have all of these on pedestals or hanging or whatever they need to be and um, get, actually get to see them <laughs> in person, you know? Well, and I think it's fun too, because the bubbles are all different colors. And so that the COVID, even though we're confined, we can find bright spots to take the time to watch the birds or to take a walk through the forest or to listen to the, to the wind in the trees. And so I think it's a good time that we kind of slow down and uh, really 
enjoy nature. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Caitlin, you're up next. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much, Claire, for inviting me to be a part of this. And it's nice to be, to have the New Mexico students coming back at me because I miss it so much. Um, so I'm Caitlin Bryson. I am from Reno, Nevada. Um, and I live sort of nomadically for <clears throat> a while, for like 10 years in my 20s farming throughout the Western Hemisphere. And then um, I landed in New Mexico where I spent some of the most important time of my life, I feel like, um, attending UNM and also just living and being there. Um, so I kind of feel like my home really resoundingly is the high desert and um, that's, yeah. There's, there's a couple different high deserts. The, the Nevada sort of big empty high desert as well as then of course Albuquerque and Santa Fe and Taos where I've spent a lot of time. Um, <clears throat> and now I live in Los Angeles and I'm really trying to make do here in the city. Um, I came here for work and to yeah, continue my art career and to kind of push it a little bit, but it's been a very difficult time. I moved to LA like right before the pandemic hit. So it's just been a really weird time to adjust to being in a city um, and not really knowing anyone. Um, <clears throat> not having those places that, you know, just being able to go out into vast expanses um, and or just really be outside in an area without humans. Um, so it's been an interesting time to adjust. And it was very interesting to reflect on all of that, um, to make this piece for this wonderful show. Um, that's been great to hear all of you as well. Um, if I were an animal, I was gonna, Davey totally took my animal, which is a spider. Um, or we share that, we didn't take it, but I, I, when you said that, I was like, yeah, spider people. <laughs> um, yeah, I really resonate with and have always kind of just felt akin to spiders. I, I like always lived in basements as a kid for some reason, not like for any bad reason, but that's just always where my room wound up in the houses that I lived in. And I kind of had a lot of spider friends and now I'm a weaver and there's just all these connections that I find really fascinating. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I have my piece set up in this like really funny home gallery situation right now. Um, so I was going to move my computer over for my pieces set up and then um, I want to actually read, I wrote a poem kind of like prose situation to accompany the box that I created and I was thinking that, that I would read that. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, but first actually I'll talk quickly about the materials but let me get I love the precarity of like, and, and or just like the authenticity of Zoom, by the way, everyone showing their boxes is really great. Okay. Maybe that way. Is that okay? There we go. Um, so the box is, I work with mycelium. I work a lot with fungi and living materials, biotic materials, but, um, yeah, so actually I grew these hands with fungi. They're made of mycelium, um, which is a material I work with commonly. Um, so that kind of represents like, yeah, my materiality. And then these are objects that I collected from um, New Mexico and my home. And then the box is actually filled, oh, you can't see it. It's filled with soil. Um, and then on the outside of the box, the words you belong are painted in soil as well. And actually the soil that the, these words are painted in is soil from New Mexico, from my old house in Albuquerque. <clears throat> How much time do I have? Do I have time to read this? It's like two minutes. Yeah, you have two minutes. Oh, perfect. Okay. <clears throat> Home is a place of longing, 
of belonging, longing to be in, a place to return to after the day's exploitations, after the day's, after the day undresses and unravels me. Home returns like a body, returning to the body is home. Home is a vast open expanse that is filled with sage and rabbit brush that sometimes makes me sneeze, reminding me that I am always a visitor, even here where I was born. It is a home that some people call empty, a home that most don't understand. Here, this home is the mind-body duality reality, a place that allows me to fill in and be filled by a sense of calm. Home is a monsoon in the distance, exploding with excited electricity and silence. Fat, voluptuous raindrops that enfold the entire active landscape into a little bead that I wear around my neck to remind me of home. When I am far away, like I am now, this home makes me cry. Fat, blistering beads that cannot be strung. I'm so far away from home. I'm so far away from myself. But I stay home in this non-home, surrounded by sirens and ghosts of wanting to belong, longing for a body and the sound of cicadas. I live in and work from this non-home for 23 hours a day. I leave only to walk or run through a littered landscape, smelling tar or sometimes exotic flowers that don't know how to survive in my home. When I run, I imagine I'm being chased by a coyote. One time I saw a coyote running with me, a city coyote, knowing how to get by, how to find sustenance under an opaque and starless night sky. I was in awe and reverence of this coyote, for I know his reflection is a tale told to shake me, to joke me back into this reality of confliction. When I stay home in this home, I need to get out of my mind so I leave my body. It can be a vicious place. So I leave and I go to those monsoons, to my grandmother, and I visit her and she walks with me in the desert and shows me the soil and tells me that this is where I come from and that my body is the soil and that my body is my home. She tends to the land and I tend to my garden and I see the soil as myself. I return to my body and I face another day inside, face repeating acts of violence on the body, on the land, I'm in disbelief. But I tend to the soil and I tend to the violence and I leave and come back home again and again to acts of returning, to acts of belonging. That's fine. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. I really like the metaphor of you belong. It's so important for us all to remember that. So thanks for bringing that. Thank you. Out. Martha. Hi, I'm Martha. And the place I came into Earth on this time was Syracuse, New York. Um, but more than that, it was nature. Um, I know that's a geopolitical social structure to say the name of the city, but being in the um, in nature, I always glommed on and felt most at home relating to plant life and um, birds and things. And I'm coming to you from the north of Cuesta, New Mexico currently. Um, the animal that I would be would be a butterfly or a bird. I used a butterfly in my box. And I also have um, had fascination as a child with butterflies. But as I think about it, I'd really rather be a bird because um, I love my flying dreams when I have them. Um, and some of my favorite compositions by a contemporary composer are um, by um, Messiaen. He's a French guy and he actually transcribes bird song and makes new compositions out of them and they're fabulous. And he and I'm being a musician as well as an artist, I really resonate with that. So I would love to be a bird and just be flying all over the place and seeing things from that viewpoint and feeling the freedom of of soaring in the air underneath my very lightweight body. Um, so I am on a cell phone and I think that I can just turn it around and then show you my box. 
There we go. So, oh, um, my box started with kind of feelers that I put out, which is kind of how I approach all artworks. I kind of go into a meditative state, but it happens no matter what I'm doing. And I just kind of open this invisible strange gate where then sensations and ideas can come in. So I started gathering some of the items that show up in this box way before I knew how they would come together. So we have this broken grid and a chair on top of the box. We have handles on the side of the box. Partly that's because it's a transportable box because the name of my work is I'm traveling home. And then inside, there is a butterfly on a trapeze there that can swing back and forth. Uh, and a teacup, which I've talked about as symbolizing um, a place that I really felt was more home than my native home, which is when I went on a junior year abroad to England, uh, really felt like, ah, this is, this is a home. This is the kind of home that I never quite felt in the USA. Um, and, and the ritual of tea. So I don't know if you can see it, but the pictures are better on the website. Um, there's a little sculpy head in the middle of that teacup. Um, I collect lots of things and I never know how I'm gonna use them. So I had this gauze and the craft paper and all these materials. I just kind of, I'm drawn to materials and then I hold on to them and then they find each other. So. That's kind of intuitively how things came together. So after I put this together and needed to then make a recording, um, it all kind of made sense. But as I was doing it, I was just um, putting it together intuitively. Um, um, I really liked this project. I am frozen. Um, Joseph Cornell does these fabulous boxes and I was really inspired to try to make something kind of intimate in the way that um, he makes boxes and tells little stories. Um, and then another thing I just wanted to say is when I actually made the recording of the story, I didn't do another take and maybe I should have. It was just like note to self. I make little notes to myself when I get inspired just throughout the day and then I listen to them later. And um, So <laughs> that's, that's kind of how it sounds is kind of as though I'm talking to myself. But I decided just to leave it there because that was um, felt authentic to me. Um, so, I think that's all I was going to say. Did I touch on everything? Um, Claire? Yeah, thank you, Martha. And I, um, you know, you okay. always have the prerogative as an artist to change something, but I really enjoyed your audio because it did feel like you were sort of, you know, <laughs> whispering it's like whispering some insights to a good friend or something like that so i really enjoyed it <laughs> otherwise i think our presentations are over we're pretty close at an hour which was sort of a goal um, for the presentations and we can go ahead and move on to any questions that people might have um, you can feel free to if you have a question to unmute yourself and ask it or you can type it into the chat and we can convey it whichever you feel comfortable with and um, so you can feel free to open the floor to that can i speak mm -hmm. go for it may i speak okay what i like i looked at some of the um work yesterday online and I like today seeing people and matching them up with their box. That's all. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I actually considered, as a curator, I considered asking people to send a photo of themselves along with it. But I, because we were doing it as an open call and we wanted to encourage people who weren't artists to not, you know, it was already quite a tall order, all the bits and parts and asking people to send audio. So I thought that would just be over the top. <laughs> that just might put people under, you know. <laughs> so but part of me was wishing because I there are people that I don't know who submitted. And um, so I was kind of wishing for that, too. So I'm enjoying that, too, Davey. Ditto. <laughs> OK.
Am I allowed to ask a question? Oh, we we're going through the chat, though. No, that's fine. Go ahead, Nick. Just go you, for it. Joy, could you describe your process of getting that texture with the paper one more time? Uh, yes, it was really a fun adventure. We had buckets of leftover pulp, and so we needed something, a surface to, to put it on. So we, we got the weed retardant cloth that comes five feet wide and 50 feet long. And so we cut two sections, five feet by 25 feet, and we laid them in this gentleman's driveway and he didn't have to use the driveway for a week or so. And then we just took these buckets of different color, there were three of us that did it, and we just threw the pulp onto the weed cloth. And then we let it set there uh, for about a week or 10 days until it dried. And then we had another great gal that cut it into strips for us and we each got the strips. And then we were able to peel the paper off. And so uh, it was really, it was like kids playing, jumping in mud puddles. It was, you know, and here we are rather older ladies and it was just a really fun adventure and it was in the fall it was cold and crisp out but it was really exciting to be able to do that the work looks like intoxicated <laughs> yeah, right. like it like it's so it's like chemical yeah. <laughs> which is and this was at 10 o'clock in the morning very, <laughs> yeah but it was well really, yeah really, i'm thinking yeah at home, it was really a fun project <laughs> cool. Um, Anne Marie, the other materials of the piece are um, a vertebrae, which I think belongs to a horse, uh, a bird's nest, a cicada, and the mycelium hands, and then the box. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, there's a question for Davey. Um, he was in, I'm reading it. <clears throat> this is from Laura Lee. He was inspired by the word trash to be able to share his experience. And I was wondering what he wants to do now with his box. Does he want to keep it for the memory's sake? Would he like to trash it to have a sense of control? Just curious what your thoughts are on that. Um. I've pondered that myself. Just tonight, listening to this thing and emptying it all out, I thought, well, maybe I should just burn it and be done with it. Thinking, um, I don't know, maybe you're never really done with it because memories don't always just disappear. So I, I don't, um, I didn't know I didn't want to sell it because I was like, I don't know. That's the best I have. I'm not sure what I'll do with it. I might just keep it. Maybe what about planting something in it? Hmm? What about Putting... planting something in it? Even oh, well, I could. Hmm? Even I, I could turn it into a... Contents. It I just be... couldn't hear you. Even with all of its contents in it to like really sort of like compost that whole experience? and like use it for nutrients for another life might be part of the yeah no. oh. I'm not sure. i also like that davy's box was one of like uh the the few that were like sort of performative like he was mm. one of the performative. i was thinking about performing with the box in some way but it just like, didn't feel like there was other things that were like calling me but i like that that was an aspect of davy's piece that it's like there was this moment of just like how like getting everything out of it, which I really love. Hmm. Mm -hmm. There's another comment, Davy. Let's see, is Davy still with us or did he lose him? Disconnected. Okay, we'll have to come back to that. We'll make sure Laura Lee that he knows that that comment. <laughs> 
Um, other questions for anyone else? We're, we're getting on with time. I know everybody has an evening you need to do. I know that I'm going to have questions the minute that I turn, you know, that I close down the meeting, but. Um, <laughs> Somebody asked Malia if the tree was alive. I remember. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it is. It, it is alive. I actually, um, I actually dug it up on a property that I lived at uh, a few years ago. So it kind of came from a different home than I live in now. Um, and like I, I think I mentioned, I don't think it will survive in this little pot that it's in right now. So I plan on replanting it in a few days. Cool. Caitlin, what was it like to like work with the fungi as a sculptural material? I just thought that was kind of interesting. It's, it's really nice. It's really nice because it affords me like an opportunity to get more intimate with like a, a really different I also like I was a farmer for many years and so like I like to be challenged by the I don't know just different variables of growing things and uh working with mycelium and forming it in its process of growing because mycelium is interesting in that well depending on the, for the most part most mycelium will take the shape of whatever you're like providing it with so like its body is its um it's like water for instance, like it takes the shape of the container that it's in. Um, and actually, like I, I grew a bunch of hands for another piece. Um, like, well, it's all been for the sort of same piece, but it's that's like one of the simplest forms to grow because you can just put mycelium in a substrate in a vinyl glove and you can, yeah, watch it grow out. And it's a really great workshop for kids. Um, and so yeah, but it takes this whole kind of like long process of like pasteurization and sterilization and cultivating like strains of mycelium. Like it was multiple steps to like get to the point of putting it in the gloves, but that's like the most satisfactory point. And then you get to watch it grow out and it's really cool. It happens, it takes about six weeks. Wow, cool. Yeah, I actually didn't realize that it was, it grew into that shape. Yeah. I thought it was a post sculpting kind of thing. So it's more like a, yeah, okay. Yeah, totally, so I've grown a lot of shapes, but this, the hands are actually the easiest to grow because of gloves, like they're, it's just brilliant. Um, so yeah, I mean the whole process like of the, from the cultivation takes about like four months, but the actual like, growing out the hands took six weeks. Yeah. It's really interesting as a metaphor right now because of all the glove use and for real yeah. stuff, you know, so knowing that kind of adds a whole other layer in terms of a, yeah. a Corona based piece. <laughs> Definitely. <clears throat> also this aspect of touch, like that's one thing. I mean, especially like working with mycelium and wanting to sort of be like more intimate, intimately connected with these more than human organisms, especially like non-mammalian organisms that we don't necessarily know how to connect to unless like our hands are literally in the ground or like we're harvesting mushrooms and we feel that sort of sense of reciprocity. Like this, this type of sort of like reaching out for fungi and reaching out to sort of connect with them um, through a, a long process of cultivation is really kind of like how at least I have been able to form relationships with them and like get to know them and their sort of their ecology and, and what they need, you know, their, like becomes like a, I don't want to say pet because I don't, it's not like I'm in charge by any means. Like I don't want to, yeah, make myself important, but it is this like, again, this reciprocal process of like exchanging information. And so by cultivating them, I feel like I learn from them. Um, so yeah, making hands is just like kind of a way to like literally touch them and reach out. Cool. Are there any other questions that anybody has? Otherwise we can. I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. I lost connection.
it's gone. Okay, yeah, I kicked the I kicked the iPhone out, so you're good now. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Did you have a question before all that psychedelia? Um, <laughs> no, I, I was answering a question and I don't know where that went because then I got about what I was going to do with the box. Okay. So I, maybe I maybe I finished it or it was good enough. The answer was the answer. and I was going to say because you mentioned that like if you were to burn it, that it would like go away, this memory. And like, like I don't view burning as that way. Like burning is just like a chemical process to like, like it's combustion. So it doesn't go away, but it changes its state. Um, right. So maybe that wouldn't be, in my opinion, like a reason not to burn it, but. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, it just turns into something else. Mm -hmm. It doesn't yeah, exactly. right, go away. It probably turn into ash. <laughs> and carbon dioxide. Carbon <laughs> dioxide. So. Davy Carroll said, it feels like when you dump all the trash out, then it is still beautiful inside. I think she posted that um, right as you were, um, you know, your technical difficulties came up there. Uh-huh. Yes, true. Yeah, I loved the um, the interplay of how sweet the box was. All your painting on it was so sweet. And then when you open it up, there's just like this spewing out of like, um, which is maybe kind of what, I don't know, this year feels like is <laughs> kind of spewed out on us. <laughs> but I don't know. I love the idea of like, burying the stuff that's inside or something but keeping the box because that sweetness is really I mean it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful little place you know that you've created so yeah thank you it is it, it yeah. is a beautiful place yeah I'm sure both the real house and the little house are both that way yeah oh, oh yeah I'm, I'm speaking of the real house too <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. And, and so thank you, everybody, so much for participating, all artists for sharing um, your artwork and then also your reflections on home. And um, there's definitely an aspect of vulnerability about Zoom. And so I really um, appreciate you all for, for being willing to, to join us in this way. It's really great. So thank you so much. and. Um, Make sure to check out the exhibition because it is fun to see the, what people did to document their pieces and stuff as well as showing them live. So, yeah. much appreciation. Stay healthy, everyone. Thank Inside you, and out. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. We'll be in touch. Bye, everyone. Good night.